everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have the privilege and honor to have Jean Houston here. who She, self -describe, she describes herself as a midwife of souls. I love that. So welcome to the show. Thank you, CJ. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, uh, it's such an honor to have you here. And I know that you'll be coming um, to Seattle this weekend on September 16th and 17th and doing a presentation. And so I thought we would do a little preview of that event. Um, so you talk about jump time as this wonderful thing that's happening right now. What are we jumping from and what are we jumping to? And what's the vision that you can inspire us with and what the thing that we're jumping to is? Well, we are jumping from uh, an outmoded situation, economically, ecologically, certainly politically, perhaps even spiritually that we're living out of the, uh, the collection of ways of being of hundreds and even thousands of years. And it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work with seven and a half and more billion people. Hmm. So we, we, have, we are trying to jump to sustainable, co-creative, diverse, essentially world civilization. Mm -hmm. World civilization, but with a high, high access to individual cultures, cultures becoming more, not less, hmm. you see. Women rising to full partnership with men over the whole domain of human affairs, with terrible backlash that's happening, you yeah. know. And then, of course, the rage of the dispossessed, which is, you know, is part of what inspires so many of the populist movements of our time. Mm -hmm. So my, my claim to fame is that I'm one of the best-traveled human beings who's ever lived which isn't too hard in the 21st century. I've worked in all to something like 109 countries mm. over the last 50 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, the world I see, however, is very different from the world that is often re recorded in the news and news media. Mm. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> yeah. Where often I'm in a country or a culture where I am there for weeks, sometimes for months, and I get to observe a very different story hmm. of really taking responsibility, You're becoming resonant and present to each other and looking deeply for what can be done to turn situations around. But your, your standard reporter does not do that. Hmm. He often comes in, gives the bad news, and then out of there. You okay, know. tell us, give us some inspiring stories of places that you've been um, that you see this sustainable diverse, uh, women-oriented, diverse culture? Like, Where, where are you seeing this? Because it feels like, at least in the U.S., and maybe it's because my lens is being shaped by what I'm seeing on the media, but what have you seen that really says, wow, why is the media reporting on this? What are you seeing? Well, for example, several years ago, there were the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the billion rising, and there you have women speaking for where women, what women can do, be, dancing, singing, shouting, the celebration, the ritual, uh, the kind of ritual ecstasy of mm. women together and saying there is a better way and then spelling it out. The incredible proliferations of women's organizations, you know, literally all over the world, whether in China or whether in South Carolina or even in Egypt, you know. Uh, this news does not get out, mm. but it's something that is huge. Women's, why? Well, women's emphasis is on process rather than product, making things cohere, develop, grow, become. Inner space often being as important as outer space. Mm. And we, if this does not happen, then we're out of here. We're out of here. You know, 200 years from now, we'll have maybe a million and a half humans left. We will look awful. <laughs> and we will be tripping over abandoned electronic appliances. So the rise of women is crucial to uh, our evolving or perishing one way. So, so, so this is the first time I've heard you, and maybe it's just what, what I was watching, but the jump time is this, this ability to jump to a higher consciousness, a higher place of being, higher being, but that we could also fail. Yes, we could. And many of us probably will. I mean, I'm, you know, I I'm, have been there in the middle of colossal calamities. I've been shot at. I've had to dive into trenches. I mean, I've had a life, lady, you know. 
I've been there holding in Africa or in India dying babies of AIDS in my arms and trying to feed them, you know, sugared water to keep them going. So I, you're talking to somebody who's been on the front lines. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it, yet at the same time, I see this enormous difference. You were asking about examples of a, all right, I'll tell you a story. So I'm in Africa and I met a, a, a small village about 300 miles from Nairobi, in Kenya. And it is a messy village. And uh, the men are not there because they're in Nairobi trying to find jobs. So it's women. And the women spend most of their time going down to find, get the water and then to bring it back. And one says to me, sister, sister, Bill, help us build a water tank so we can collect the water. And so we do that. And sister, what about our side by side? What do you mean side by side? Well, that's where we live, telling jokes, you know, complaining about our husbands, uh, sharing recipes, you know. And now we don't have that. Help us build a tea house. Tea house. We built a tea house so they could face each other. Well, when these ladies were facing each other, all the energy of the doing, of the possibility, of the transformation rose up, and they found ways of, you know, getting rid of the flies on their children's eyes. Mm. And they danced and they drummed and they sang a new reality. The streets became absolutely clean. The sewage systems were put in. The uh, edu- the school children were part, part of the transformation of the village because now they were facing each other. Mm. You know, is a, and that then became a model for villages all over Africa. That's the sort of thing you see. But you have to listen deeply to people to find out what they really, really want. But women in each other with that enormous, not only what is there between them in terms of ideas and process and making things cohere and grow, but it's something else. It is as if a rising tide of evolution or social evolution certainly is, mm. is in us. And I find that everywhere. So yes, you hear about all the bad news. And it's, I sometimes say, People get mad at me because if Trump didn't exist, God would have had to invent him. (laughs) 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 It has created so much trauma. (laughs) Making people up big time. And this big time shakeup is resulting in people taking responsibility, knowing what their values are, coming forth with what is really their deepest knowing and belief system or be, being able to do a rewrite on it. Uh, I, I see this enormous shift everywhere. Mm. 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 Yeah. So in, in some ways, and I, um, it's funny because um, I get together with a dear group of uh, friends in a book club and, um, and we're, it's, it's sometimes, it, I feel like it's PTSD now. Like we get together in like <laughs> new cycle after new cycle yeah. I'm shocked and further shocked. And it's, at a certain point, I just start numbing out. And I, and I think that that's one of the risks, right, is to numb out and not get activated and not get inspired, but get numbed out. And I think that that's one of the hardest things, actually. Even for me, is I feel a little bit like hollowed, numbed out a, 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 after these series of recurrent, shocking pieces of news. But what I do say is that, um, and they, you know, you're, you're probably familiar with Kali, the destroyer like it feels like i have pictures of her in various places i'm a collective so yes i have a lot of kali mods but... yeah and yeah. and he's like the male version of kali i don't know what the male version is i'm sure that in some religion there's a male version but there's someone that has to come in and destroy everything so that we can build anew that's the only that's the only thing in my spiritual mind that i can say that kind of calms me down <laughs> it's like <laughs> i don't know all right, let, let me tell you a story about somebody I knew who, um, she was a student of mine and studied a lot of my processes for how to quicken imagination, creativity, get going, you know, begin to develop so many of the untapped potentials that we all have but don't use. And uh, she, her name is Elizabeth. And she was a woman from originally from Samoa, Samoa. And she was 
in a city that's about 160,000 near uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And she kept wanting to be part of boards, board of education, board of this and that. But she was so bored by the boards as everybody else of the boards was bored by the boards. So I said, for God's sakes, Elizabeth, why don't you use some of these processes that I've taught you, how to tap into the creative process, how to actualize from image to manifestation, how to do all these kinds of things, how to really cross the great divide of otherness and see people in their fullness and not as a projection. Mm. So she did. And she did so well, and the, and the board meetings got to be very interesting, that she was elected mayor of this town of 160,000. It's over 200 now. Wow. And not only was she elected mayor, she was elected mayor for seven terms in a row. Wow. And not only last year or two years ago, she was elected head of all the mayors of, of, United, of the United States. Wow. Cities. Now, wow. what was she she was changing. She was an evocateur. She was a provocateur. She was changing the mode of relationship and focus. When you change focus from outwardly objective, linear, serial, you're boring everybody in sight, you know. And so uh, and you fall into, what should we call it, serial monotony with regard to mm. <laughs> what you But she changed it. Changed the focus. Had mm. people from the depth of their capacity and not from just an objective thing that they wanted to get done. Mm. Yeah, sort it's, of. Uh, yeah, I get it. You know, it's a, uh, this summer I did this workshop with a bunch of uh, students from Duke. And then I also did um, this wealth management group. And I thought, you know what, I'm, so I've been doing meditation in the corporate setting, which at first I was a little bit reticent and then I embraced it. And then people are now asking me, because I come in and oh, there's that weird lady. So they'll say, are you going to start the meeting with the meditation? And, <laughs> just, <laughs> and it's shocking to me. I'm like, do you need one? And they're like, yes, please. <laughs> so I do this meditation. These are the most conservative people, East Coast, Northeast people. And I I wouldn't have thought that in a million years. And then, then recently, and, I, and I'm going to be doing a workshop with a bunch of lawyers and I'm going to bring my, my shamanic drum. <laughs> I'm going to bring the shamanic drum. Oh, that's it's, wonderful. It's, wonderful. No, and then I'm going to start drumming. The whole current beat that gets them all, uh, you know, essentially. In a trance. Well, in a trance, yes. You're altering consciousness without vision. Without visionary vegetables. Yes. So, um, so I've been doing that. And I can't tell you, first of all, I, I never know what's going to happen. And I go in there with a little bit of trepidation. But at the same time, the last time I did this with the students were like, it was so relaxing. It's the first time I felt relaxed in months, which people are craving this stuff. You know, they're craving this excitement and energy and something different, like you're saying, nonlinear. Um, but it's hard to snap out of that. You know, I think it's hard. But what 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 gave your uh, person that you worked with, this person who's the mayor of all mayors now or leading all the mayors, what gave her the courage to do that, to snap out of the, you know, the ordinary place and move into something extraordinary? She was bored. <laughs> the big one. And she also knew that, you know, from working with me and my students, she knew that there were other ways of doing things. Mm. of these ways of being, doing, acting, using much more of the self. When you use more of the self, you become almost a t completely different person, you see. Mm -hmm. We are not, we are not encapsulated bags of skin dragging around dreary little egos, you know. We have many, many personas within us. Ego mm -hmm. is but one image of the many, many images of the human psyche. And we have whole personas. I mean, if I look at myself, I say, well, I'm a teacher, I'm a dog person big time. I'm an archaeologist. Uh, I'm a writer who doesn't like to write but has to. You know, I'm a, a stand-up comedian. I mean, I could go on and on. Right. But I may have to bring in the stand-up comedian and let that suffuse me if I'm in a really difficult situation where people are very nasty to each other, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I tell jokes, and I know when I die, they're going to open up my head, shake me upside down, and all it's going to do is pour out thousands of jokes. I'm the 
the uh, comedy writer. He wrote the Bob Hope Show and mm -hmm. Burns and all that. So, I mean, from a simple joke, like, uh, so Mr. and Mrs. Flea, little fleas, go to the movies. And they come out, and Mrs. Flea he says to Mr. Flea, um, Darling, shall we walk home or shall we take the dog? <laughs> <laughs> Something as silly as that. <laughs> Extremely complex Jewish field, you know, which which then really have multiple levels of humor. It's interesting. So it's drawing on those aspects of yourself that are called forth at the time as they're needed. Yeah, almost, but they move in almost like total persona. Mm -hmm. But you have, you know, so I show people how to develop maybe 10, 12 different persona that then bring a different mindfulness or even a different skill set to bear upon whatever is needed, you see. Mm. It's funny because right before this, um, I got a, a phone call from a friend who um, did this performance art piece, and, and, um, and it was for doing something that was raw, emotionally raw. And so he um, took his performance piece, was all about um, his struggle with depression to the point that he almost killed himself and how spirituality has helped him find his self again. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the response from people when he brought up this persona that his just true authentic self was out of fear. So people are saying, why did you say that you almost, you know, did this? That's awful. You shouldn't be presenting this kind of vulnerable part of yourself. So how do you respond, like when you're bringing up personas that are authentically yours, or is it just judiciously choosing which persona to bring up at the time and responding appropriately? Yeah. Sure, it's, it's when you have access to these different persona, you have a natural good sense about which one to bring up mm. and which one to. So I keep about 15 or 20, you know, going or available to me. Mm -hmm. I've had to do that in so many travels where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite tall. I'm 5'11". Mm -hmm. And I'm often in situations where people are 4 feet 10. Right. <laughs> For example, this, this would be southern India. Mm -hmm. So I dress in a sari. And, of course, I'm not very good at it. And I'm, it's, I dress badly. And the little ladies come up to me and say, Sister, oh, you look so terrible. You look absolutely terrible. We have to fix you. Come on, we have to fix you, you know. <laughs> Before you know it, we're fixing and we're all laughing and we are singing songs, you know, uh, and um, we have crossed the great divide of otherness. Mm. We, are, we are pals, we are friends, and I always expect to learn a great deal more from them than what they learn to me. And so, we, we, you know, there is that resonant phenomenon that happens, and mm -hmm. then you can do the deep work of... For example, some of the things we did when I was working with the Institute of Cultural Affairs, where we would uh, create model villages, but from their knowing, not from our laying down any Western motifs, but from mm. they, mm. how the women can have equality, how, you know, the, the nature of what is the society they really want to live in. And it turns out everybody seems to know. And then you how to how to go about creating it. Mm. And then those models for other towns throughout, in this case, was India. You know. So if we weren't linear and logical and boring, <laughs> we would be dancing and singing and talking. As most, societies, as most societies do, they dance and sing. Right. And, uh, I, as a very young girl, as you know, I knew Mrs. Roosevelt, mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she gathered together young people. This is 19... 1954, and she had just left the United Nations, just retired, and she was gathering young presidents of their high school to uh, learn about the United Nations, international work. And she was very clear that with all the problems that were going to come upon us, we really had to learn to deeply talk to each other and begin to really co-create. At one point, she also said to me, my dear, I rather suspect you're going to have a most interesting career. <laughs> but remember, my dear, as a professional woman, you can expect to be trashed. She didn't use the word trash, but it was something like that. But remember, too, my dear, 
A woman is just like a tea bag. You put her in hot water and she just gets stronger. You know, with... <laughs> I love that story. You know that story. I've told that a number of times. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It she seems... was yeah. so beautiful when she was older. It's interesting. It seems like there's a lot of um, opportunity for women. It, but it's so hard to break that divide, right? Because we're, and maybe this is just a, a story that I've told myself that, you know, there's, it's so hard. You, there, this is a male dominated linear world. It's very hard to break through. Um, even if I put on my different personas of, you know, maybe I put on my, you know, tough corporate persona or, you know, I try to put on a different persona, my funny persona, whatever. Sometimes it's still very hard, I think, even as, even well, I though I hear your, I hear like this call for responsibility and ownership to this area, but I also find it difficult to do. Well, suppose you were to walk into what you thought of as a male dominant society, and you at least pretended that that wasn't so. Then, boom, a lot of nonsense drops away, and you go in, and you're friendly, and you introduce yourself, and uh, it, you have already lifted their reality. A lot of patriarchal societies are very bored with themselves and really are it's worse than that I mean they are uh, they are in a kind of stupor of self-hate mm. and this is you know and self-negation mm. that comes from thousands of years of knotting of saying I can't I won't I'm not worthy you know this this comes with it what you're looking at just the top veneer of, of patriarchy. Look at all the darkness mm -hmm. that is using because it hasn't worked. And now we are, you go into a woman's meeting and there is a kind of jolliness and uh, a reaching of, across and, uh, uh, you know, a kind of culture of kindness. Mm -hmm. found. So... There are going to be people who, you know, so as you said, Trump is kind of stirring up things for us. And there are people who are still holding on to this old way of being, um, right? There's a, a whole bunch of people following him that want the old way to be the way and to no longer have this, whatever is trying to emerge, to emerge. What to do with those people? I mean, I don't want to necessarily... I, I actually have compassion for people because it's hard to go. I've gone through changes myself, and it's really hard to go through those changes. I have compassion, and yet I've still gone through those changes because you cannot resist what is happening. So well, Let me check the story about this because I see where you're going. Now. Yeah. Um, some years ago, I was in probably one of the most fundamentalist towns in America, and a whole group of women showed up ready to sort of block me from saying anything. And it was very clear. I could just feel the hatred pouring out like bullets, you know. Um, and um, I sat down and I said, well, what do you want for your children? Well, in school I would sort of read this and this. I said, well, that's very interesting. T tell me about what. Well, he seems more interested in art, and that means that he has a different kind of mind, which also is a mind that can actually go into engineering, believe it or not. And then we, then I would talk, because I do know a fair amount about education and uh, children, and explain that there's no such thing as a stupid child. There's only incredibly stupid systems of education. So we never got talking about fundamentalist religion. We talked about what was really closest to their hearts, mm. which was their children. Mm. And then for a while I became a kind of... Uh, uh, the person to go to for fundamentalist <laughs> education. <laughs> you know, it was very nice. We made lots of friends. Wow, so, interesting. See, I don't ever go in with the sense of, oh boy, <laughs> here's the war. No, you really have to go in with a kind of <clears throat> stupid, if radical, innocence. Mm -hmm. There to really appreciate everybody, mm -hmm. to appreciate. And then what, I mean, in that example that you gave, it was really tapping into something that they truly cared about and just starting to build from there instead of talking about what, I don't even know where you, you said you were, you were going to be talking about education at that juncture or these women that no, were protesting? No, I was going to talk about 
human potentials, but they didn't want to hear because they thought some of them had to do with closing your eyes and going inside. Whoop, the devil. So we never got to that. Got to education. Interesting. Okay, God. So you just found the thing where they're ready to talk about something that they cared and you just got curious and innocently approached the whole thing. That's how you drew the connection and, and found commonality with them. And that's how the discourse happened and the connection to the point that now you're the fundamental Christian lady <laughs> to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so if you're a woman who is, um, distressed you know you uh, I have a group of these seven super powerful women some of which are um, going into like wild optimism to the point of not necessarily even seeing any of the negative some of them who are going into the most you know doubt filled fear place um, I'm trying to I'm, I'm, I'm desperately trying to stay on this balance between the two Mm -hmm. um what are different reactions like you know so i'm sure you've had your own experiences with what's happened politically economically how do you balance the two um is a balance important is it better to go on one side or the other what how do you manage i don't, I don't do it with words that's one thing okay um, because the words i have become concrete concrete eyes in their mind, and it, it, it brings about the shutdown. I go in with music, hmm. or dance, hmm. or jokes. I shift the modality. And if you shift the modality, the messaging opens up, you see. So hmm. in my sense, there's always a lot of music, dance, of laughter, and then the ideas come in through the back way and they have already been elevated. They are no longer the, these, these sort of clods of concrete thought because everything else has shifted in the body-mind speak system. I speak to the whole brain, mm. but not, not, to the, you know, not to the idea that has been gotten so stuck. Okay, so if I'm like, I can't believe that Trump isn't going to lay the deck, la, 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 then you'd like start playing music? Like what would... <laughs> what well, would... might be funny music in the back. Uh, you know, some comical type of music. And then we would have Trump imita imitations, and then we would also see Trump 20 years in the future as a very old man. And it, whatever it is, you've got to turn it upside down. That's the genius of humor. It mm -hmm. takes the things that you take seriously, it shakes them up, you know. Right. It, it, all right, for example, I'm going to tell a very sweet joke, but you'll, you'll see what I mean. Okay. okay. So... Uh, Mr. Warren, who sells tractors, comes to the farm where Farmer Brown, who raises pigs and apple trees. And he's very surprised to see Farmer Brown picking up a huge pig, putting it up to the apple tree. Oh, the pig gets an apple. And he puts it down, picks up another pig, puts it up there. You know. And Mr. Warren says, Farmer Brown, why are you doing that? It would be so much easier just to shake the tree and then the... The, the, the pigs could be eating the, the, the apples on the ground. And Farmer Brown says, this is a Vermont joke. I, uh, you're probably right. Picks up another pig, puts it up there. But Farmer Brown, what a waste of time. I, uh, but then, what's time to a pig? <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's one of those subtle jokes. But yeah. what, what you do is you change the vibrational feeling, tone, mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. art, dance, very good food, mm -hmm. you know, comfort food, if the case may be, if you don't want it to be interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you just bring in other modalities. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm, I'm hearing you're shifting them by bringing in those other modalities, like you're bringing in um, your whole brain, you're shifting the perspective and you're no longer just fixated on one point. So I may have started one pointedness looking at things and then you're just broadening my awareness. This makes you profoundly stupid. That what? It makes one profoundly stupid. What makes, one, oh, when I, when I fix on one point, I see, yeah. Yeah, because we only see one point where there's like, you know, a whole one pixel versus a whole picture. So you see, this, my work, 
in this regard began many years ago, <clears throat> expanding the sensibility by expanding imagery, uh, laughter, uh, access to different states of consciousness, because different states of consciousness give you very different realities. Mm -hmm. you know, hyper alert state is one is, is a very particular reality. A somewhat meditative state gives you a totally different reality. That's, that's the brilliance that we have to join, if you will, the United States of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Humanity, yeah, so. I like that. Um, I have a new way of, of explaining this thing. I'm, we're going to be doing um, the, the thing that I'm going to be called in and I'm, I'm bringing in my drum. Um, it's to do a business strategy planning. <laughs> so it's a very non-traditional way of doing it. But I thought, you know... We can, I know how to do it kind of the linear way, but I'm telling you, you're going to get way better answers if we do a meditation and talk about what inspires us about this business and what our vision is and, and drawing on these other senses to bring about things. But I think it is a, I, I, it's more because I know that it works and less because I'm trying to increase the vibration or change the perspective. But I think that that really is on an intuitive level, that's what I'm doing. But I think I'm realizing now that consciously what I'm probably doing is shifting the vibration, changing the perspective and allowing newer things to arrive. Uh, you've brought in the telescope, the microscope and all the medium scopes. You have literally <laughs> shifted fo focus. Shift focus, you shift reality. Yeah. All right. So now I want to find out about you because you've had such a phenomenal life um, as a woman. Um, and you talk about evolution and that we all go through various uh, stages of evolution. Um, if you were to kind of describe your own life and how you've mm -hmm. evolved, how, how have you evolved over time? Well, when I was three years old, like many three-year-olds, I knew everything. <laughs> that's probably <laughs> true. Yes, that's right. You're the least polluted at that moment. That's right. And then it's downhill all the way from that. Yeah. No, I, I was very fortunate in having very interesting parents. My father was an extremely funny man, mm -hmm. and professionally so. And my mother was a deep and wise woman. Mm. And they were very kind people, too. I went to 20 schools before I was 12. Wow. My father was writing the Bob Hope Show. And this was during the war years, and Bob was on the road, and my father was on the road, and he decided to take us all, including all the animals, mm. <clears throat> which was a problem when he sneaked a swan into the stateroom, and he, he bit <laughs> the conductor, but that's another story. He had a swan? Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And the absurd was always around the corner. Right. Was, yeah. It, Sounds like it. And my father gave me my, I suppose, the mantra by which I knew myself. He said, Jeannie Pot, you're more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And that became who I was. Oh, you know, the fun. one who the kid who was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Anyway, so that helped a lot. Mm. I mean, the, I lived in a, a world of cascades of laughter all, mm -hmm. all the time. Mm hmm. Uh, but I was also uh, spiritually precocious, not even spiritually. I was theologically precocious. So at the age of five, do you know this story about I have, I've heard it, but please tell everyone else because it's so fantastic. Catholic school. And um, <clears throat> because my father remembered that he had promised to send me to Catholic school in order to marry my mother. And uh, everything was okay except my father would gag up my catechism and give me the most interesting question to ask poor little sister Teresa. Oh, oh man, poor <laughs> Teresa. I counted my ribs, and I counted my friend Joey Mangiavella's ribs, and we got the same number of ribs. And I want to know, if God made Eve out of Adam's rib, how come? And everybody raised their undershirt and showed we all had the same life. Or, Sister Teresa, when Ezekiel saw the wheel, was he drunk? Or, Sister Teresa, when God... When 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 Jesus rose, was that because God filled him full of helium? <laughs> this went on and on, and everybody thought it was very serious questions, and she got so angry at me until I finally asked the ultimate question, which haunts the mind of every little Catholic child. Sister Teresa, and she lisped very badly, yes. Did Jesus ever have to go to the bathroom? That did it. No. <laughs> <laughs> she put up a sheet of oak tag and wrote, Jean Houston's ears in purgatory. <laughs> I asked one of these questions, big X, 
Each X was a million years or so. End of the first grade, I had 300 million years in purgatory. You know? Oh, wow. I think of my father, he thought that hilariously funny. He, and he said, you think you got problems? Wait till you see what they did to a real saint. And he took me to see this wonderful movie of 1943, The Song of Bernadette, mm-hmm. you see. And everybody's in this rapture. In this, and, then, and then when Bernadette, when the Virgin Mary shows up in the grotto, suddenly, in the, in the, in the midst of this rapture of spirit, this huge, horrible, mule-like whinnying laugh fills the theater. And it's coming from my father, who's in total hysterics. And, every, and the Sicilians, who are the Sicilian section of Brooklyn, right. start making evil gestures. <laughs> the you know, and I'm very worried. And I say, Daddy, get out of here. Why stop that? This is the right. Holy Ghost. He says, yeah, but you know who that is up there? That's Linda. Linda Darnell playing the Virgin Mary. Hot damn. I told her she's that far. He burst of laughter. And I said, Daddy, just go to the bathroom. Anyway, going home, when I run upstairs and I kneel in front of an empty closet because Chicky, our dog, had nine pups there. And I pray to the Virgin Mary, please, 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 please show up in the closet the way you did, you know, to the, into the grotto for Bernadette. I'll give up candy for a week, okay? Two weeks, okay? You don't know how we count. And no Virgin Mary, just more doggies would get back in the closet and push them up. I counted a higher and higher numbers. I, I gave up. I gave up candy. I gave up my favorite foods. I mean, chicken with garlic sauce and Sicilian stuff, artichokes. I gave up everything. And then there was nothing more to give up. And I got up and no Virgin Mary was showing up. And I walked over to the window and I looked down. And there was my grandfather, Prospero Tadaro, who knew of his his feet only by rumor as his stomach began there, you know. So, yeah. And he was trying to put smudge pots under the fig tree. And suddenly everything opened up. There was plain in the sky and everything. And I knew that I and my Mary Jane shoes and the pups in the closet and my grandfather Prospero and the plain in the sky and new wheat in Kansas and, and the little boy who waved at me when we crossed Kansas in the train and, and everything was there. And everything was interrelated with everything else, and it was moving together, and it was so very, very good. Mm. And that experience stayed with me all my life, that everything was dynamically interrelated to everything else. Wow. And in more years, when I study quantum physics, I realize it's true that, you know, we don't just live in the universe, the universe lives in us, and mm. we are just... God's stuff put into a biodegradable space-time suit. <laughs> you know? And once you shift, and this is my, 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 my latest work, once you shift focus and you know yourself as the universe in miniature that you have all manner of access, whoa, it's like all these different clouds and veils fall away and you become capable of all kinds of things. But one thing the universe, you know, uh, turns on and off every, uh, what, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And so it means that everything, including all memories, are turned off and turned on. Mm-hmm. So if you sustain a different memory, you enact it from something that happened a long time ago, not a major trauma, but a major, a minor thing, until you really see it in a different way. So, for example, a person who had always had a sense for art, but in the third grade, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Goat, Goatface you know, came by and said, stop drawing, you, you have no talent whatsoever. But suppose she had come by and said, how wonderful, Johnny. It's a, what is it? Oh, it's a house that looks like a fat person. How creative, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But we put that we put that in, and after a while, it's not simply overwritten in your brain. It is. I happen to believe it's overwritten since we are part of the universe in the universal mind and memory banks itself. And then all kinds of things shift and shiver, mm. and even domino effect, 
throughout your life and suddenly you wake up one morning and say, I'm going back to, I'm going to art school. I'm going to just, it's in me. I'm an artist. Mm. Well, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So that, that, that pivotal experience, mm -hmm. it's almost that it seems like at that, it almost sounds like you were enlightened by age three, you know, because if, if you describe enlightenment as it's not being separate from God, but seeing your experience is one with God, one with everything, because at that moment, as you're describing, it feels like the, the dualistic universe became one and you could see how it's all connected. And that's how it's hilariously funny, right? I mean, if you, I mean, it's, you know, it's that every, all of us are out there playing little plays or little, so that I get the persona thing because you can whip on a mask because isn't that what we're all doing anyways is putting on, different masks and playing around with the mask. So somehow that age three, it shifted your perception to understand the truth of, of the existence of somebody you live in. That's, am, am I making up something or is that's what it sounds like no, for me? That's, that's what all the great mystics or high creatives have all discovered. Mm, yeah. And it is a huge play. Of being. Yeah. And now you're just having fun with it and playing with it. And, yeah. You know, if you need to be theatrical or if you need to be funny or need to be demure or whatever it is that you need to be, you just bring it up at will. Because it's all part of us anyways, right? They're all aspects of our humanness. Why are we giving them if we're not supposed we to do something with them? We are not schizophrenic, ultimately. We are polyphrenic. Mm. <laughs> so many different parts to us, so many different selves. Mm. But we are acculturated to look and feel in a certain way mm. and not but you know through all of history and that is that's the big shake-up that is the big big shake-up and that's why it's so fortunate to be alive in this time I mean other times in history thought they were it they're wrong they're wrong this is it this is it the pain though <laughs> I guess that you have to great change comes great pain though I, I assume well to some people it does and to others it's just funny but or it is a great combination of both whatever it is it's a good thing because it you know it brings fervor and energy to your emotions and your emotions then if your emotions are quickened this is one of the great principles of the, the great magicians of the past you know the maguses that what they did is they joined personal emotional energy to spiritual energy and through that together, knowing that they could orchestrate reality. Mm. Mm. The shamans, as you know, did the same with the drumming, with the singing, with taking on the totemic animal. Mm. They changed all the focuses and then the world opened up mm. because they put so many more parts of themselves into the action, into the reality. I remember uh, a long time so I, I don't know if we're running out of time for you, but uh, this is such an interesting story. I was brought in by the World Health Organization to um, among the uh, Pueblo Ind Indians in the southwest with young doctors who were teaching these, these particular tribes um, inoculation, sanitation, etc. But in exchange, they were going to learn how the local shaman or medicine man worked. And what happened is they brought in a man who Western, a native person, who Western medicine had completely given up on. He had everything wrong with him. He only had a few months to live. He was put down in the center. The family was around with others. And the medicine man, the shaman, chanted the long story of creation. Mm. You know, how the great female goddess, sometimes just corn mother, sometimes you know, other, other names, but how... She created the world, and this song was, I don't remember the, exactly the chant, but it was something like, And also singing the story of creation, of gender. Well, this went on for at least seven days, seven nights. Wow. Well, I mean, wow. people would often come back, but it went on and on. And at the end, then, he took colored sands and he painted the, I think it was Corn Mother, 
painted the story of Corn Mother and the creation on the man's body. And then he blew it all up. The man got up and was perfectly well. What was happening? He was translated to the time of the ever-present origin in the universe, which is going on all the time. The death and rebirth going on all the time. And thus the patterns, the optimal patterns of this man. Wow. Entered. Wow. So he literally ship manifested the recreation of this man and got rid of his illnesses then as well. Because the man was repatterned. He went back to the essential template of being because it was a story of the creation of the world. Yeah, reset to creation. factory settings. <laughs> wow, wow. So the challenge is for us to, to me, that really inspires me to say, well, how do I, how do I get to that three-year-old moment or that repatterning, right? I mean, how do you get to that place of the purity where you can just be reborn where do you you go with where your your instinct and impetus is mm -hmm. now if i said mine was music which often it is what is yours what is your cutting edge of becoming what do you really enjoy doing being well i love doing these interviews because it's just so much fun for me this is my travel i love traveling and this is how i travel is that what you mean or something else? Well, it could be that. I mean, I'm uh, sure. Uh, and I know when I coach, what people say is I'm like Pele because I just, I tune in. I'm like, ah, that, that, that. And, and I just, <laughs> then it's like, okay. that's well, then my Then you would do the same for yourself. What you do for others is, is a midwife of souls. Mm -hmm. you, would do, you would do for yourself. You put yourself almost in uh, a gestalt kind of relationship sitting opposite you. And you would then as the high CJ, you know, right. the meta CJ, right. you would do that work with yourself and pull out these different elements and then begin to do the weavings, the interweaving of them together. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah, so it's finding the greatest thing that you have to offer and then offering it to yourself, okay. repatterning yourself in it's kind pattern. of a new way. And also, I'm, I'm an old Platonic scholar, you know, Plato, mm -hmm. you know, something of a Greek scholar, and, uh, well, I was, you know, done. and what I do is really look for the optimal template, because Plato talked about how everything had its, mm. its moral, psychological, physical ideal in the universe, so that there is an optimal template, you know, for everything, including ourselves, mm. and tap mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our, op our factory settings is each, each unique. In, in optimize for a particular thing, going back to those settings and figuring out what you're optimized for. We are as different from each other as snowflakes. We're not just flaky. <laughs> There's no flaky in our variations. Yeah. So this workshop that you're going to be teaching coming up in Seattle, what kinds of stuff are you going to be doing in that well, workshop? Well, on the Friday night, I'm doing... Uh, uh, what do I think they call it? It's the rebirthing of humanity, the new humanity. Oh, just that? <laughs> are you going to rebirth everyone there? Of course for that. No, but I'll just say these are the things that we've discovered. I may drop in a few exercises of showing what is actually trying to rise in us mm. in it's so much challenge. Mm -hmm. and as we are in the time of speciation. Mm -hmm. We're moving into another form of our species. Mm -hmm. But you need this level of uh, challenge, conflict, uh, energetic shifts, uh, the inexplicable being the, the being the explicable. It, we, are in, we are in what I once called in one of my books, jump time, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm going to be talking about what I think it is happening, how we tap into it. Mm -hmm. And then for the two days, I'm doing something called on Saturday and Sunday, part of the day's uh, holy darkness, holy light. Mm -hmm. And I'll nature of the darkness in the universe, which is 96% of the universe, by the way, mm -hmm. where only 4% is visible. But what is the generative code that rises out of this seeming darkness? And darkness not as bad, but as a creative, generative place of becoming, how to tap into that and to bring the dark into holiness, the dazzling darkness, the 
the mystics call it, and then what is the nature of life? We, like, we are made out of life. We are photonic beings. You know, we're frozen light. Mm-hmm. So light is, and, and then we're trying to translate it into understanding our present situation. Mm. So these are, are they experience, it's a part knowledge base and then part lecture base, part experiential in both days? There is, it's probably half and half. Half but and I, half. You know, I'm an experiential evocateur, so I always do things. And, and it's not the places where you get embarrassed and you have to get up and declare <laughs> embarrassing things. It right. is, is it, I don't do that sort of stuff, no. Right. It's kind of quiet or you can do it with another person. I'm not going to have to embarrass and myself in front of everyone. It can be very musical. You know, and, uh, oh, I okay. I think I'm going to have to go. And then on Sunday, uh, I, I preach. I preach on, um, you know, what what big shakeups do to us mm. and how to how to begin to really work with a big shakeup so that it really has a positive and creative intention. Mm. Mm. I love it. All right, so you're coming on uh, this Saturday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, at seven, seven to nine, mm-hmm. and then, and then the Holy Darkness, Holy Light is in uh, well nine to five, five on Saturday, and then it's broken up on Sunday with two. Uh, one thirty to five. I have yeah. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. one thirty to five. I can't wait to see you. Uh, I'm so inspired after this conversation that I am also going to sign up for this class. So hopefully I'll be able to meet you in person when you come up to Seattle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Tell your friends and do come. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.